Hey Power Appers, this is Brian Knight from Pragmatic Works, and in today's video, we're going to discuss how do we build an effective strategy for laying out your environments at your organization. So stay tuned. When you're looking at the Power Platform as an IT administrator, it can be a little bit daunting, and it might feel a little bit like the wild, wild west, because anybody can now build a chatbot, can build an automation, or can build an application in some cases. So whether you're a project manager or a full-time developer, this platform kind of democratizes that. So it feels a little bit like the wild, wild west. Well, to tame that wild, wild west, Microsoft is giving you environments. Environments are a collection of a whole bunch of all of your, uh, your apps, your users. Uh, it also contains all of the, uh, your, uh, your chatbots, your flows, everything is set for, at least at this time, Power BI reports. So environments help you wrangle all that, those, those disparate things in. Now you have up to seven types of environments and one of those is going to be a default environment also. But now you're not going to use all these types, but they each have their own pros and cons. The ones I want to bring you, your attention to right now, though, is the default environment which we'll discuss in just a few seconds. The production environment, of course, as you can imagine, is for production. Uh, sandbox is more for development, where we can build out, we can wipe and load it much, much easier. Trial environments come in a few different flavors, but trial environments do not go against your tenant's uh, capacity. So you might have every environment you spin up uh, will cost you a gig of space against your Dataverse capacity. Now, that gig is not counted for things like the trial environment or the developer environment. The developer environment is your, your community license, your developer license for building out applications. And there's also a Teams environment as well. Now, a few things you want to kind of look at as an administrator. To tame this, to prevent your users from adding their own environments and creating a uh, kind of a, a, a very, very disparate system, you could turn it off to where they at least have to request uh, access to build out an environment. You could do this in the admin center, and I'll show you where this is added in just a few moments here as well. Your default environment is a very special environment. Everybody has maker rights that has a license of Power Apps to this environment. So this should be really, really treated as a personal productivity environment for you to build applications that are not necessarily mission critical. These are applications that are not supported by IT typically, and it's a little bit more wild, wild west in this environment, and that's okay. This is where you can embrace that. But you can also put things like data loss prevention on that to make sure that people aren't using connectors that you don't want them to use. Things like maybe SQL Server or SAP, you can prevent them from in this environment because it's, it's a mission critical application that's using SQL Server or SAP. It does not belong in this default environment. Now, there's a few reasons why. First of all, everybody's a maker, so it gets really crowded really quickly. But additionally, there's no way to do proper application lifecycle management here, right? You can't promote that application from dev to QA to prod. So the first thing I typically do is limit the number of connectors inside this environment. I'll, I'll do things like restrict SQL Server in this environment. And then also that's using data loss prevention, which is our follow-up video to this. I also would prefer to not have any mission critical applications inside of here. So we'll, we'll put some controls on that also using the COE toolkit, the Center of Excellence toolkit. Now a better strategy, first of all, is to rename that default environment. I name it, rename all of my default environments to personal productivity. So your users know exactly what they're getting into when you're building out that environment. You want them to stay in that for only personal items. You also will want to create a data loss prevention on that environment as well. So I'll show, I have a follow-up video on that. Now here's a, a sample layout that, that uh, I find works really efficiently. Okay? Now each environment you spin up cost you a gig of space in the Dataverse and Dataverse world. Now the default, of course, everybody's a maker. That's a little bit of the wild, wild west. Communicate the purpose of that by renaming that environment. Then every, every one of my developers also has a personal developer environment. So this is for, uh, it comes free with Microsoft. And you can find my video on that also uh, about creating a personal environment in the description of this video. 
So these are free licenses for your, for your developers, and you can promote applications out of that into the other environments once they're production ready or QA ready. Now, on top of that, you might have a shared dev, test, and prod environment. Most organizations are fine with just that, dev, test, and prod, and they're done. If you're a large organization, though, that has some super mission critical application, you might stand up a dev test QA for that one critical application also. So this gives you a few extra perks by doing this. The first perk is every one of those environments has its own Dataverse database. So you can have a test database and a QA database and a prod database, of course. It also gives you the ability to delegate who's the admin in those environments as well. And of course, you can do you can build solutions and have it automatically migrate from environment to environment. So a little checklist you want to do here. As you set up an environment, make sure you restrict who's in there. Okay, so you can add a security group to that. Uh, make sure you communicate the purpose of it and set up a, da a DLP, a data, a data uh, loss prevention policy of some sort. All right, so let's get into this and see uh, how this looks. So I'm gonna go out here and hit my gearbox up in make.powerapps.com. I'll go to the admin center and you'll see a list of all the environments that I have at Pragmatic Works at least. Now that is really interesting, but the first thing I always do on this, once it opens up, goodness, all right, there it goes. You'll see a list of environments that you're the admin of. So if you're seeing a blank screen right now, it's because you're not the admin of any of your environments. Now the first thing I always do is hit the gearbox again in the top right setting and go to the power platform setting. You'll see it, oh, you'll see it right back there. Oh, lost it. Here we go, power platform setting. Okay, so once you see that, go into, go into that settings and this is where you can, you can light, uh, uh, protect who actually can create the application, who, who actually can create new environments and who can tra create trial environments also. So you can limit that to where, now trial environments, keep in mind, will automatically expire after 30 days and they're not eating your environment's uh, capacity. So it, you make a decision there. I always, though, will, will only allow certain admins to create new environments there. And you have to be part of the Power Platform admin team to be that, to do that. Okay, and after we do that, I will go ahead and cancel or hit save, of course. Now, also, I'll look at an environment like Brian Deploy Test, for example. And as I go into this environment, you'll notice it has a URL up top. This URL, if it's an important environment, is completely incomprehensible here in this case. So I'll hit the edit button, and I'll also go ahead and protect that, or not protect that, but just go ahead and give it a better name, like Brian Test, for example. Now you'll also see a security group down here. The security group allows you to say, hey, is, if anybody is, is not part of that group, they can't even see the environment also. Now, once I hit save, it's going to go ahead, oh, that's already been uh, occupied, looks like. I'll get, I'll get and cancel that. Uh, looks like somebody already is using Brian Test. Uh, anyways, after you do that, it will validate to make sure it's available, and then it will reprovision that. Uh, just make sure any links that you've, that you've created point to the new one instead of the old one. Additionally, in your environment, you can per, you can see when is it going to be on the different waves of the of the database uh, database updates. So these are the all the new updates that they have twice a year, wave one, wave two. Uh, this is the fall release. You can see it's on right now. Uh, some of my other environments might have it off though. Okay, so once you're ready, these environments can be used to back up and restore. They can also, I can, anytime I can convert this to production, I can also, this is a sandbox environment, so I can always reset it back to its previous state. And you have things like settings. Okay, now in the settings, this is where you can say who can come to the environment. So I can go to security role and limit who can actually be in my environment uh, under, under user, excuse me, and provide them security roles. Environment, in short, environment makers have the ability to create applications, system administrators or your administrators, and there's a whole bunch of other ones. Basic user allows them to see Dataverse, their own data for the system tables, and there's other ones like that also, and you, of course, can create your own as well. And then your users are who has access to this. You also are going to want to go under product and features and turn on certain features that you think your users may want at an environment level. So at this environment level, I'll go over here and you can see that things like the geospatial, I want to have a uh, mapping built in or the address control built in. If you do that, just simply turn it on, acknowledge it, hit okay, it's a free feature, so I'm gonna turn it on, and then I'm all set there. Once you're all set, hit the save button. 
So there's a whole bunch of features like that you want to look at at an environment level. You also can use things like the Center of Excellence Toolkit to consolidate all the environments into one view for the IT administrator. That's a free toolkit you can download. The link for that will be in the description of this video also. Okay. Now lastly, you can, as you do this, you can also go over to resources and capacity and find out how much capacity each of these environments is eating up. Whether it be in Teams, which gets its own capacity, or whether it be regular uh, Dataverse capacity, you can find out how much space each of these is being used uh, right here. And you also have a full view of your trial uh, tenants here as well, or uh, uh, trial uh, environments as well. And you also have the ability to do data, uh, data prevention policies. You'll find that under policies over here and data policies. These policies uh, will allow you to create um, which connectors can be used in which environments. We'll have a detailed view of that in a follow-up video to this video uh, later this week. All right, so again, the first thing you wanna do is when you go to environments is look for that default environment. I've already renamed mine, personal productivity. So when you select it, you can go over to the, the oh, oh, I'm gonna go back one more time here, excuse me, uh, environments, and then, oh, where'd I go? Where'd I go? That's where I was picking these randomly here and go to that. There we go. Excuse me. There we go. So go to any of these environments here and you can hit the edit button right here to change its name. Uh, that's one of the first things you want to do. And you want to communicate a strategy around that. The COE toolkit has a whole bunch of applications for your users to request access to an environment. So you want to make sure you install that, even, even that application in its own environment as well. So I have an environment here called the COE Toolkit uh, somewhere in here. Okay, there, oh. It must have expired now, it looks like. Uh, yeah, I had, had a trial environment, must have expired here. But I'll have a follow-up video on a COE Toolkit, and again, it's, the description of this video has a link to it as well. But a COE toolkit has a way where you can uh, monitor all your environments, what connectors are being used, and what apps will also need licenses. So a few things to keep in mind from this, in this presentation. Make sure you separate dev, QA, and prod into its own shared environment that you give all the developers to for those important applications. Rename your default environment, personal productivity, and build a data loss prevention policy that monitors all that. So if you want to use things like SAP or SQL Server or Oracle or whatever the connector is that's more of an enterprise connector, go ahead and have that, have that isolated to certain environments where the, where the rules are a little bit looser, but it's also being monitored tighter. Typically, most organizations will not support uh, apps in the default environment or in that personal productivity environment because it's meant for non-supported team kind of applications. All right, thanks for watching this video today. This video is part of a series. We'll have a whole bunch of administration videos. Uh, next one coming up is on data loss prevention. Thanks so much, and please do subscribe if you find this video and other videos interesting like this. Have a great day.